Good morning. This is uh, one of my favorite times of the year is when we start thinking about the end of the year and thinking about Christmas and the holidays and families and the weather and all the things that tie into this type of season. So I'm hoping that since uh, Thanksgiving that everybody is getting their holiday spirit on and enjoying the events and not let themselves be worried out with all the hassles that does come with this time of year. Lord, we just thank you today for what you're allowing us to do and coming to share and coming to love you and coming to hear from you. And Lord, we thank you that you have a destiny for us, all of us. And God, that this is the time that maybe not be right on the exact time, but it's when we celebrate you coming into this world as a human being. And we thank you for it, and we thank you, God, that you did do it. And because of what you did, we have hope, and we have a purpose that we probably would not have if you would not come into this world and died for us. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the subject that I've been asked to talk about today, preach on, is doubt. And I'm going to share what the dictionary says doubt is and what I believe doubt is. And then we're going to talk more about why you should be more focused on what you're after rather than dealing with doubt itself. And then we're going to read what the Bible actually does talk about the issue of doubt and what that does. Before we really start talking about doubt, I think it's important that we set boundaries and a specific subject to deal with doubt because you can have doubt on a lot of things. So we're going to narrow that down and talk about doubt in believing that God exists and believing in who God is and believing is, is his word true enough that I should have faith in his word and in him. So we're going to focus the subject of doubt around that specific, specific subject rather than just talk about all types of different doubts. One of the uh, things that the, Bible, uh, the dictionary says, that doubt is when you kind of made up your mind on something, then in the middle of that, that you decided, you change your mind or you consider different than what you thought about it before. Okay. So doubt is not the same as unbelief. You may think it is. It may be connected in some way, but it's not the same as unbelief. Unbelief is where you have decided not to accept something. You've made up your mind, I, I don't want to accept it. I don't, I don't want to embrace that. Whether it's a fact that I can see or something I can really look at, I'm decided that I'm not going to trust it and I'm not going to have faith in it because it won't work. It can't do that. Uh, even though I know a plane can fly, but I don't believe it'll stay up there when I'm on it. 
So I don't have enough faith to get on a plane because I think it'd be the one that decides not to fly. Okay, that's my unbelief. I'm just made up my mind. I don't want to, I'm not going to accept it. Even though I know planes fly, so it's not the fact that they don't, but some do fall down. And I've decided that what, when I get on, will fall down. Now, I actually don't think that I'm just using that as an example. <laughs> okay, well, are you with me? Okay, that's, that's unbelief. So if I have unbelief, there's no need for me to doubt because I don't believe it in the first place. Okay. So the nature, into or, in order to even embrace doubt, I already got to accept and use faith or accept something. All right, so I'm not in unbelief. I'm, I'm believing it. I'm willing to accept it. Okay. Jesus wants was doing a healing, actually a casting out of a demon. And the man said, it was about his son, and Jesus said, do you believe I can do this? The man said, will you help me with my unbelief? So it wasn't that he really doubted that God could do that. He just didn't really believe he could. And he says, help me. And God did. He helped him by doing it. But he also wanted the guy to know that it's part of a, a relationship and partnership when you enter into having a relationship with God that your part is believing in things that you cannot necessarily see or you don't necessarily have the full facts or the full results of what you're believing for. But you have to believe as though you do already and though you have already got the benefits of everything before you actually give because you're in that process of getting that. Where Doubt is where I am willing to open a door or go down a road that I don't have to go down. But if I do go down it, I have to take certain energies, certain moves to embrace that doubt. So I have to give myself some evidence to convince myself I should doubt this. Okay? One, sometimes we make a mistake in especially dealing with God that to me, I need to be aware or sure that God exists. And since I can't really see him, I need to see some type of evidence that he's existed. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I think you almost have to. But I need to see some evidence. And since I'm in need, because I guess I have to ask myself, do I need God? I mean, after all, I'm here, I'm alive, and if I say I don't want to believe, well, I drop dead. Well, we know that's not true. If you don't want to believe in God, you don't just drop dead. So I don't necessarily have to believe in God in order to exist. Now, the Bible does say that if he wasn't who he was, you wouldn't exist. I mean, there is a truth that God says. But do I have to believe that or not? Well, the evidence, God does exist. And because he does exist and always have exist, you now exist, whether you accept that or not. Okay. 
But just because you don't accept it and you want to stay in unbelief. Now, if I decide that if I'm going to accept that God exists, what is the evidence in my life? Well, will it be that if I have a problem and I ask God for help and he helps me, then that means he exists. Okay, to me, he exists. But sometimes that can be a problem if you only think God exists because he meets your needs. Because if he doesn't, especially the way you think he ought to, then you may change the fact that you believe in him or not because he didn't do what you felt he ought to. Or if you've been taught that God shows that he exists because he's constantly rewarding you. Well, I believe God rewards us. I believe God wants to. But I don't necessarily, that is a result that he exists because he rewards you. And I think there's a danger in if that's how you work your belief system by what he does or doesn't do for you. It does give more room, if you look at it like that, to doubt, because it's based on performance. I have a good job. I believe in God, and the evidence is that the pleasure of life, or what I think I should get out of life, and I ask God for it, he gives it to me, so I know God is blessing me, and that he exists, because after all, everything I ask for, he's given me. But if he starts taking those things away in that way of thinking, do I still believe in him? Do I still believe he's blessing me? Well, if that's how you see it, probably you'll start not wanting are not continuing to believe in him because it's based on what he's doing for you and what you get out of it. And again, I'm not saying that's bad, okay? I'm just saying it will make you like a teeter-totter up and down on how you relate to God because it's based on uh, a performance that what God does or doesn't do. On the other hand, if my faith is based on who he is and the relationship I have with him and the fact that I found out what I read about him that he's written for me, his word, or if somebody tells me his word, but it's still based on what he's written, that I begin to understand and see that there's an evidence that shows me that he is faithful and that he is a person, a spirit being that does fulfill his word. And the more I read and the more I embrace him, I begin to understand that I can't separate him from his word and his character. And as I start having faith on that, I'm able to not be like a teeter-totter because it's based on his unchanging ways. It's based on him always doing and being who he says he is. So when I face something that's a challenge that I'm going through. His word says, if I believe that his word is powerful and that he is a loving God, then by his spirit that now bears witness in me that he exists, so my foundation is based on a true witness 
that God is in me and talking to me. And that through his word and through the people that he's put into my life that also believe in God, I begin to know that he is real and that he is faithful to me. So when something comes up that gives me the opportunity to open the door or go down a road of doubt because there's certain facts that say it's possible this won't happen. It's possible that even though I believe that God can heal me, the evidence say I'm still fighting this disease that they say I have. And I've been believing, and yet things haven't really changed. So what do I do now? Well, if you're performance-based, you're probably having some issues and some problems because the performance isn't happening. And it's probably just that you do start saying, well, wait a minute, you know, God says if I believe, and I, I believe I believe. I mean, I read it, I know God is real, and I'm trusting it. So I believe I believe, but my believing has it really brought the change I want? Okay? But the question is now, do I keep on believing? So I'm at this crossroads. Do I still believe that God can do this? And it's a little bit more tougher now because there's some real realities the effects of this disease I'm still dealing with, okay? So, I mean, it's the real, my body still hurts, or I'm still going to get the cancer treatment, you know, all these things that still I'm dealing with. So, I'm going to have to see this from another perspective if I'm really going to believe God can help me here. So, I'm going to have to not look at it from a performance point of view. Not that that's wrong, and not that I should give that up. But at the moment, that isn't what's gonna get me through here, okay? That door starts to look a little bit more appealing. That road of saying, I know I'm not an unbelief, because I know God exists. I know that he is healing other people. I mean, there's evidence. I know people who've been healed, all of that. So I know God does that. I know God answers prayers. Okay, so it's, I have evidence that God is functioning. But the problem is, it's not working for me right now. Have you been there? Maybe it's not because you're sick, could be for other things. Have you been there? Well, I think we all been there and probably going to go there again. Okay. Is it a sin to have doubt? Okay. Brother said no. But there are some people that believe it is. And they're performance driven. They say, God wants me to do something. And he's told me to ask you to help me. So I need you to give me some money. So I can go and do some things that God wants me to do. And maybe I am doing those things. So it's not that I'm not doing those things. But I'm telling you that God told you to give me some money. And I then say, you know, God says that we should give and bless those who give to a prophet or bless those who give to somebody that's doing something godly. And it does say that. I won't say it, don't say that. I believe that. 
But now I'm telling you or trying to convince you, if you give to me, then God's going to bless you more richer. God's going to do some things that he might not do for you, but he will do them for you now because you are helping me. Have you ever heard that? And I'm not saying God won't do that. But now we put a performance before God. And I'm telling you, if you don't do that, then things won't go right for you. That thing that you've been hoping for may not happen. Have you ever heard people say that? That's not right. I know, but I'm just saying before I make that point, sometimes people make you feel like you got, you know, see what I'm saying? And first you said no, and you're right, but then there's people who teach that the other way around. Are you with me? Okay. I've had somebody say, when they have tragedy in their life, they say, well, have you been keeping up on your tidings? Yeah. But that's not what the Bible says. I know. But, I'm like, what, I but what I'm saying is some people do teach that. Will you, are you with me? And if you heard that, you know I'm, I'm saying right, that some people do that. But what God says that you need to do is trust him. Okay. Now, I believe God is in to performance. Okay. That God is going to perform. He's going to make something happen. All right. But the real evidence is not really that he performs. It's that he does exist and now I'm in partnership with him because of him. I'm not believing because I want to, which is good, but I'm believing because he's given me the ability in my spirit to believe. Did you get that? So he's helping me to believe. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons he came here on earth is so he would die and be able to start a reunion back with you, literally living in you. So now you have him in the spirit living in you with his ability. Isn't that cool? So it's more about the relationship of who he is and his faithfulness in doing what he said. Are you with me? Okay. Now, if I start embracing that I've had certain experiences, and I believe anybody that believes in God, from the moment that they start believing, with the witness that God starts doing things that bears witness to their spirit, they start growing in that relationship. If they really start taking his word and allowing it to change them, not just the written word, but the spirit of the word that literally is alive and literally is written in your heart, this realm of your soul and in your spirit, not necessarily your beating heart, begins to bear witness that things are changing for you and you know it's not you. But it's up to you to be a part of that by taking ownership to that. Okay? So it only makes a little sense that when I'm dealing with tough situations, that I begin to go in the direction of the relationship with the one who's faithful. And I start looking at some of the things that he has done for me to encourage me to go beyond a new place where I'm at. In the Old Testament, there's a story of David before he's king and Saul the king has been chasing him and actually trying to kill him. So 
he runs into uh, the Palestine country and he's hiding. And there's a time when he leaves his camp and leaves some people there and they go into this uh, king that's kind of of the enemy that's been kind of helping him and t protecting him. And they're over there and while they're gone, some other people come in and take everything that was David's. Takes the cattle, takes the women that were there, takes everybody that was there. So when they come back, everything's gone. And the men get discouraged. Matter of fact, it says they felt like stoning David. Okay? But the Bible says David did something. He encouraged himself in the goodness of God and what God had done for him. Now, he's discouraged like everybody else. Matter of fact, because he's the leader, he's got more he lost in them. Matter of fact, I think he had two or three wives that's gone too. But he starts looking at the faithfulness of God and he begins to encourage himself and all of a sudden, God brings the answer. And they get their stuff back. Now, if he would have took a hold of that door of doubt, by the time the answer came, he probably wouldn't have took it. Because he's already been beat up and gave up hope. Now, this is something the Bible says is interesting. Sometimes people take this out of context. First of all, we know that God does not take bad things and put it in your life so you can see he's good. He doesn't do that. But he will take bad stuff and do something with it that you can see he's good and help you. But he didn't bring that into your life. But the Bible does say that your faith will go through some trials. And sometimes those trials are demonstrated by God. Okay? And it helps you grow. Not all trials are necessary, something God put in your life, even though you trust him. I would say probably most of our trials come from stupid mistakes that we make, that we shouldn't have made, or we didn't really think the whole thing through. But I think when you really serve God and you're in relationship with God, you kind of know when it's something God is allowing you to be stretched in versus you just doing something that you shouldn't have done or you made a mistake. And you recognize that this situation, God is stretching me. Now, yes, God wants to heal me. God doesn't want me to be bound by this disease. Please know that. Please don't even question that. God doesn't want anybody sick. Sickness comes from sin that... Satan started by rejecting God's kingdom, and then he was able to deceive and coerce Eve and Adam into disobeying God. Adam actually chose, Eve actually was deceived, but either way, they opened the door for sin and sickness and everything else that came with it. But God didn't throw up his hands. He still loves his creation. He's given all kinds of medicines that come out of the ground that we take and make other medicines out of. That comes from God to help with sickness. But he also gave his word that you can speak and be healed. 
But there's times when a situation puts you in a, a spot that if you trust God, if you embrace who he is, you will be stronger and better for it. And as a matter of fact, what he wants to bring out of you can't come any other way but for you to know him in a different way than you've known him before. That's the building of your faith. That's stretching you. That's taking you beyond the natural realities of things. That's kind of like Peter walking on something that you shouldn't be able to do. So it defies the natural laws and the natural understanding of things. But as you go there, after that experience, it's like, now you really understand greater than you did before, that he is, <clears throat> he is all that. He is sufficient enough. He's what Mo Moses says, what should I tell the people who you are? And he said, I am, I am. If you want a I am experience, then you're going to go to some issues. Because that's the only way you can get them I am experiences. By allowing God to take you where you have to determine, I'm going to embrace him. I'm going to go after him. I'm going to take the faith that I have already walked in and I'm going to step up another step. Because he said, if I lean on him and I'm yoked with him, I cannot fail. And I'm not giving myself any option. As a matter of fact, this is a personal decoration for myself. I have made up my mind. When I'm in those issues, I don't even consider doubt. Doubt is not where I'm going. I don't have to fight doubt. I don't even have to reject doubt. Because if I don't pay any attention, it's already taken care of itself. What I need to do is look at the answer to the problem and go there with the quickness. As I used to say when we were kids, with the quickness. Mama said, boy, get here right now. That means I need to move <laughs> right now. Not think about it. I need to get in action. <laughs> okay. With the quickness. Okay. Because I know that's where my safety is. I am a person that believes that God has given us ability to walk in an atmosphere where faith literally changes things. If you really not studying, you may miss this, even though if you read Matthews, Mark, Luke, and John, it's in there. But there was a few disciples who had an atmosphere of faith. And when they walked, just their shadow changed things. Because that's what Jesus did. Just the touching something of Jesus healed people. That's an atmosphere. Do you want that? Now, you can believe for that because you read it. But my question is, do you want that? If you want that, and you're asking God for that, then understand this. Then he's going to have to give you some situations that will take you beyond your comfort zone. That will take you into the realm of that atmosphere. Sometimes they're not all that difficult things. Sometimes it's just a simple thing. 
like waiting on a job. A job that I have no business getting, even though I'm skilled for it. Because there's a lot of loopholes, there's a lot of things in front of me that might keep me from this job. But I've asked God, and I felt like in my spirit and in my relationship with him, he told me that he was going to give me that. But I need to tarry. But while I tarry, I am going to go through what most believers have to go through. It's called a fight. Because there's a kingdom of resistance that comes from the realm of Satan that is going to try to keep me from believing that and walking in that. One of the reasons is that atmosphere he's afraid of. We notice when we read the Bible, there were times when demons would say, why are you here, Jesus? Are you here to get me now? And he really wasn't there to do that. He was there to bring compassion and to share about who he was and who God is. But someone was controlled by a demon. Just the very reality of God made them say, all right, what was that? It was his authority. Faith brings a level of God's, we're talking about God faith again, a level of his faith brings a level of his authority into your life. And spirits or things that aren't of God are subject to that authority and that atmosphere because of who you are now as a child of God. Do you know that? If you don't know that, please, excuse me, please understand that the Bible says that that's yours. Now, use wisdom, especially in a world today, because there's all kind of danger in things out there in the world. But know this, as you allow God's authority to come into your life, that you can walk in a level where a lot of things won't happen to you because they're yielding to the authority that's in you that God has put on you. And when you do have to face something, don't forget who you belong to. Don't allow the circumstances to bring doubt. Sometimes we make the mistake of allowing circumstances to bring doubt. When, if we understand who we are, it can be an opportunity to become all that God has for you and who he is for you. So what are we talking about? Well, the Bible says we're talking about renewing your mind and how you see things. And now that you are a child of God, because his spirit is constantly bearing witness to you, and all you had to do was say, okay, I'm not going to be an unbeliever anymore. Now, that doesn't mean that all a minute this, that I become a believer, that I have all the faith in the world. That's a process. But it does mean I have enough to have his spirit bear witness to mine that he's real. And that has nothing to do with me anymore. And it has to do with him, because he said that. Okay? He said that. 
whosoever believe on me will be saved. Whosoever believes on me will be born again in the spirit realm while he's alive. So that's not something I need to do. It's something I need to know he's going to do because he's faithful. And his character says what he says has to happen. So now I'm embracing that and I'm not giving myself any room to consider anything else. Because in order to have doubt, no. In reality, it takes more energy to embrace doubt than it does to embrace faith. Did you really think about that or know that? First of all, because God is God and he's given you faith, you're already in it. So embrace it. Now doubt, you got to open that door or go down that road. So you got to make some effort to go there. You got to say things like, here you go. Every time I do good, something bad happens. Always happens to me. You just put your hand on the door. Even though God says everything you touch will succeed. But you didn't go that way. You got this door. Okay. You got that door. Now, does the door exist? Absolutely. In order to have faith, the reality of doubt is always there. Okay? Just like life. Life is real. Because of what Satan done, the flip side of that is a death. It's just there. So doubt, by the nature of having faith, is always there. If I'm unbelief, there's no need for doubt. Are you hearing me? It's only when you have belief that the cousin jumps up and there's doubt. But it's not like faith. Faith will come after you. Do you know that? God has gifted you with faith and he'll make it come after you. And all you need is a little bit to move him out. But you can run from faith. You can eject faith. But if you're in the kingdom, according to the word, it will come after you. It's yours. But doubt, you got to go after doubt. You got to feed it. You got to entertain it. The question is why? Now that you know God, you have to accept that the unseen does exist. Is that not true? You say, I don't believe in spirit. Well, if you believe in God, you now believe in spirit. Right? Because he is a spirit. And if it's bearing witness to you, then that's now a reality of a fact. Now embrace it. I got to go to work. And my gas gauge is almost on E. And my car gets about 14 miles a gallon. I got to go 20 miles to get to work. Now the question is, do I have enough gas to get to work? Well, facts say by the gas gauge, I don't. 
But is that really to say that I still can't do 20 miles? And we're not talking about miracles, just the reality. I may still get 20 miles. Well, just, just looking at doubt right here. If I tell myself that it will get me there, if nothing else, I'll be on films, but I'm going to get there. And then I get paid so I can get gas when I get back. But if I start saying, well, I'm probably going to get stuck, then I'm going to be late, then I'm going to get fired, and you go through this whole thing, Even if you make it, you know what the saddest thing is? You never enjoyed the whole ride. <laughs> you let doubt rob you of the reality of the joy of getting there. So why open that door? Why don't you tell yourself, boy, well, at least if I even don't make it and I only get 15 miles, it's better to walk five than 15. <laughs> They're 20, I mean, I'm five miles closer. See what I'm saying? Because I'm seeing that I can do this. I'm already grabbing a hold of faith saying I can do this. So my attitude is all the difference. My wife is sitting to read something the Bible says. Pretty much everything I've said, in a way, but we'll see how the Bible really puts that. James 1, 2 through 12 in the NIV. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's kind of what I've been saying, but just making it in a different way. That's what we can look for. Well, you may say, well, I'm not sure if God really exists. And I'm not sure if he really wants me to have a relationship with him. That's a fair thing to think. But let me ask you this. Have you really asked him to show himself to you? And even if he does, and you don't get it right away, he's not mad at you. Ask again. Because he really wants you to know him. Actually, that's the reason he created you. So you would know him. And he has a plan called eternity. Yes, there's a glitch in the roads called sin. But God already made a provision that you still can know him. You still can find your destiny. 
All you got to do is ask him. God, if you're real, simple prayer, show me. Help me. Then God, I'm going to tell you up front, I got a lot of unbelief I'm bringing to the table. As a matter of fact, I've never had a father or my mother's been me. So you can already see I'm starting from a ditch to trust somebody I can't see when I can't trust the people I can see. But then God, if you're really real, you already know that. You already know what you got to get through. Now, all he's asking for you to just say that. And then when he starts showing you, you don't have to know God all your life. Just don't go to doubt. Let that be not an option for you. That's the easiest way to deal with doubt. Don't put your hands on the door. Don't go down that road. Okay. If you're even, oh, if you're even thinking about God, please understand this fact that God says you couldn't do that 